Greetings, dear students. Today, our lecture will be about Y chromosome, sex determination, and X inactivation. So let's start with Y chromosome and neal development. So as we know, normal human somatic cells contain diploid number of chromosomes, right? 23 pairs of chromosomes. And we remember that from 1 to 22, we have autosomes, and X and Y represent sex chromosomes. And there's XY in boys and XX in girls. So here's the question. Is it Y chromosome that determines the maleness? Or is it the presence of two X chromosomes that determine the femaleness? Or does the maleness result from the lack of a second X chromosome? Yes, interesting questions. So um, the, the correct answer is the first one. It is Y chromosome that determines the maleness. So there are three types of sexes. This is, there's chromosomal sex, um, and uh, it means that whether individual has XX or XY set of chromosomes, there is gonadal sex, which, determine, which uh, represents whether individual has testes or ovaries, and there is phenotypic sex, right? Whether phenotypically individual looks like a male or female. And in normal conditions, there should be a correlation uh, between these three, but sometimes there may be incoordination, right? And then uh, there may be some sex chromosomal uh, disorders. So uh, the fact that males with Klinefelter syndrome, Klinefelter syndrome is 47XXY, have two X chromosomes and one Y, and that the males, females with Turner syndrome, Turner syndrome is 45 X, they have only X and Y. This indicate the role, about the role, crucial role of Y chromosome in the normal male development. And this is because X and Y chromosomes have unique biology, structure, function, size, and biology as well. So X and Y chromosomes require special attention because they structurally and functionally differ between sexes. They have their own specific patterns of inheritance and they are involved in primary sex determination. And at the same time, interestingly, they pair up in male meiosis. Uh, X chromosome is a large submetacentric chromosome. It contains about 1500 genes, and most of these are not related to sex. And Y is acrocentric and is way much smaller. Actually, it is the smallest chromosome, and it contains about 75 genes, and most of these are related to sex determination and spermatogenesis. So, uh, Despite the fact that these chromosomes are so different, they still have some regions on them that recombine during meiosis one. So they pair up during meiosis and undergo crossing over. And these regions are located on the edges of X and Y chromosome, and we call this pseudo-autosomal region. So each one of these has two pseudo-autosomal regions on the edges of each chromosome, right? And pseudo-autosomal means because pseudo is false and autosomal. So it means that these regions behave like autosomes during meiosis, but they're, they're not autosomes, right? So pseudo-autosomal means that these are sex chromosomes, but they contain the regions that behave like autosomes during meiosis. And this diagram nicely depicts the picture of the part one and part two, so the autosomal regions that recombine, but at the same time, along the X and Y, there are some genes that are that are the same. For example, ZFX, ZFY, and so it means that this gene is on X chromosome, this one on the Y, AMGY, AMGX, and so on. Uh, the rest, 95% uh, of the Y chromosome does not synapse or recombine with X chromosome during meiosis. And we call this region male-specific region of Y chromosome, or MSY. So what happens during sexual differentiation? By this we mean that when the embryo is conceived, right, uh, for at about um, until about five weeks of prenatal life, 
the embryo is sexually indifferent. So it's neither male nor female, and it contains bipotential gonads. And there are two sets of ducts in the embryo, <coughs> Wolfian for male and Mullerian for females. And then we will talk that at certain point of development, why embryo becomes male or why embryo becomes female. So by about seventh week of gestation, if the cells contain XY constitution, then the testes begin to form. And when there is absence of Y, then uterus, cervix, vagina begin to form. So the presence of Y chromosome and the development of testes with male hormones inhibit formation of female reproductive system. This is very interesting and please let us define this again that when there is Y chromosome it triggers male development but when there is no Y chromosome doesn't matter how many eggs it contains absence of Y will inhibit formation of uh, male uh, uh, absence of Y will trigger the development into female so Bordering the pseudo-autosomal region, there is a special region uh, which is called sex-determining region of Y chromosome, SRY. And this region plays crucial role in male development. Again, we see that human embryo, which is about five to seven week of gestation, and then XX genotype, when there is absence of SRY, it will turn into female. And the embryo which contains XY and where SRY is present, it will become male. So as we said, by six to seven to eight weeks of gestation, SRY gene becomes active. It will start expression at this period of time of development. And it produces protein TDF, testis determining factor. So it is located in the Y chromosome, as we said, right? And it becomes active early during development. And this causes undifferentiated bipolar gonads to develop into the testis. Interestingly, TDF activates anti-Mullerian hormone. And this causes atrophy or repression of Mullerian ducts. So anti-Mullerian hormone suppresses development of Mullerian ducts and formation of female reproductive, uh, reproductive duct is prevented. Thus, it is the absence of the Y chromosome, of course, which contains SRY, that leads to female development. Because if there is no Y chromosome, there will be no anti-Mullerian hormone, and there will be nothing to suppress Mullerian ducts, and the development will turn into female. So as we said, SRY is located near the pseudo-autosomal region Y. And normally, as we know, X and Y chromosomes exchange in meiosis 1 within their um, these special regions. But in rare cases, crossing over may exceed the normal region, and it may also involve pseudo-autosomal region. So in this picture, you see the black uh, shaded sections of the chromosomes, these are pseudo-autosomal regions. And then in the blue, we see these are the regions with a rare crossing over. So, how do you think what can happen if in an individual, crossing over will involve SRYTDF region as well? Such type of mutation will lead to rare but highly informative abnormalities, and we call this sex reversal. Because here again, we see that there's X and Y crossing over involved the SRYTDF region, and then um, a chromosome, X chromosome, will have translocated SRYTDF region on it, right? And this will be because, yes, it's X chromosome, but because it contains SRY, this will be phenotypic male with chromosomes of 
two X chromosomes. And the Y chromosome, which lost its SRY, it does not contain SRY anymore, so it will result in phenotypic female who has X and Y chromosomes. So again, XX males are phenotypic males. The karyotype is 46XX, and it possesses SRY TDF translocated to the short arm of the X chromosome. And similarly, X and Y females who are phenotypic females, the karyotype is 46XY. They have lost the SRY TDF from the Y chromosome. This again demonstrates that it is Y chromosome with SRY TDF region on it that determines the maleness, and it is not the absence of X chromosome. There are other genes involved in spermatogenesis and sex development. These are AZFA, B, and C. AZF stands for azospermia factor genes. DAS genes deleted in azospermia genes. And USP9Y, uh, which is required for normal spermatogenesis. So there are a bunch of other genes that are involved further in normal male development, but the triggering the initial development, whether it's a male or female, this is about a survive. Now let's discuss X chromosome and the process which is called the phenomenon which is called X inactivation. So it's interesting that how can females have two X and males have only one X and this does not run into gene dosage problem. Gene dosage means how many copies of the genes we have per genome. And interestingly, the question is that how come that females have two and males have one X? And why, why two X is not extra for females? Or how come one X is enough for, female, enough for males? So there is genetic mechanism, which is called dosage compensation. And this balances expression of X-linked genes in females and in males. So again, gene dosage is the number of copies of a particular gene in the genome. Dosage compensation is a genetic mechanism which equalizes the expression of X-linked genes, which is accomplished by random inactivation of one of the X chromosomes and this leads to formation of bar body. So bar body is inactive X. Regardless of how many X chromosomes a somatic cell contains, all but one will be inactivated and will be seen as bar bodies. So for example, in Turner syndrome, as we said, which is 45X, there is no bar body. There is physically one X chromosome, which is active. The Klinefelter syndrome XXY, there are two X chromosomes, right? So one will stay active, another will become inactive, and there'll be one bar body. In a karyotype, which is called triplo X, one will stay active, and there will be two bar bodies. So the concept is that the number of bar bodies is N minus 1, and N is the number of X chromosomes. So, again, to clarify this, uh, normal males, no bar body. Klinefelter female, 45X, of course, no bar body. Normal female, 4666, one bar body and one active X, right? Klinefelter, again, XXY, there's um, one bar body and one active X, right? So, for example, a female who has three X chromosomes, there will be one active and two inactive, right? Or a female with tetra X, three bar bodies and one active X. So it doesn't matter how many X chromosomes there is in the karyotype, just one stays active, all the rest are inactivated. 
Again, uh, a diagram which shows different karyotypes, a number of active axes and the number of inactive axes. And we see that the number of active axes is always one, and the number of inactive axes equals to n minus one, and depends on how many X chromosomes you have, n minus one. The number of inactive X chromosomes is always one less than total number of X chromosomes. Here we see one bar body, two bar bodies, three um, and four. And the, the, the concept is that inactivation is extremely necessary for life. The embryos that have more than one active X, they do not survive. This will be miscarriages if something happens during development and this prevents inactivation of X chromosomes, such embryos just will not survive. Here is the question, why karyotypes like Turner or Kleinfelter or Triple or Tetra X is not normal? If anyways, there's one X that is active and um, the rest are inactivated, right? Because neither of these karyotypes are result in normal phenotype. There is still some abnormality, so to say. Because there is a reason. Certain X-linked genes are still being expressed before the actual inactivation begins. So before X inactivation is triggered, it begins uh, in uh, female embryos, two, uh, two X chromosomes, certain genes from both Xs are being expressed. Then, not all genes of the inactivated X chromosome are actually inactivated, and about 15% of them escape inactivation. And interestingly, additional 10% of genes show variable X inactivation. They escape inactivation in some females, but not in others. So, not every gene on the X actually requires inactivation. We have some genes that still express from inactive X. Genes that escape inactivation are not distributed randomly along the X chromosome. More genes escape inactivation on distal XP, about 50%, than on XQ, just a few percent. P stands for short arm and Q stands for long arm, right? And this finding has important implications for genetic counseling in cases of partial X chromosome aneuploidy, because imbalance of genes on XP may have greater clinical significance than imbalance of the long arm of X chromosome. So there is so-called Lyon hypothesis. Uh, Lyon, Mary Lyon, um, was a scientist, and in 1961, she independently, um, two scientists, Mary Lyon and Lyon Russell, they independently proposed the hypothesis that answered these questions, right? The questions are that which X, paternal and maternal, is inactivated? Is the inactivation random? Is the same X chromosome inactivated in all somatic cells? So the Lyon hypothesis postulates X inactivation occurs randomly at about 16th day after fertilization, when the female embryo consists of about 200 to 400 cells. X inactivation is permanent in the cell in which it happened, and so it will remain inactive throughout the lifetime of that cell. So until that cell dies, in that cell, whichever X, maternal or paternal, is active or inactive, these will stay the same till the rest of the life of that cell. Each descendant cell has the same X chromosome inactivated as the mother cell. What we mean here is that we realize that the embryo is developing by mitosis, right? These are mitotic divisions, and the embryo is developing. And so if in the mother cell it was paternal X inactive, all the cells that descend after the division of this cell will have the same X inactivated and the same X will stay active. 
Um, interestingly, um, descendants of each cell line have the same inactive X, and this results in mosaicism in females. So some cells of females have inactive maternal X, and some cells uh, have inactive paternal X. And here on this um, uh, uh, diagram, it's nicely shown in two different colors, the patches, right? So, uh, as we know, and as we'll say later, X inactivation is a random process. So, in any female, some cells contain maternal X and some cells contain paternal X. And females, every female is mosaic in regards to X-linked genes. The mosaic expression of X-linked genes distinguishes it from imprinting. Remember, we also discussed imprinting. And imprinting also presumes expression from only one allele. But in imprinting, the expression of one or the another allele is, depends on uh, uh, parental origin, whether it is solely maternal or solely paternal. But the inactivation is random process. Here we have this nice diagram, and we have, for example, a zygote, um, X from one parent and X from another parent, and then we realize that it's an embryo, it's about 200 cells. In certain cells, one X gets inactivated, and other cells, another X will get inactivated, and when the cells divide, all the cells that descend from this one will contain same X. And here, if these cells uh, are descend from, from this cell, right, they will have another X inactivated. Again, we see paternal, maternal, right, and X inactivation happens. XI stands for inactive, right? And then we will talk later how X inactivation happens. It's an epigenetic process, and it will shrink. Yeah, its chromatin will be condensed. Um, and it will turn into so-called bar body. So a classic mosaic um, example is calico cats. One of the genes for hair color is located in X chromosome. The gene makes either orange or black hair color in cats. And so we see that, see it's X chromosomes, right? And the Girl cat, and there are two copies, right? One code for orange and another code for black uh, fur color. And then when in embryo, X inactivation happens and the cells further divide, right? Some cells end up having one active X with expressing orange color, and another cells will end up having another X which is, expresses black fur color. And so if you guys ever see a cat in the street that is patchy with black and orange, um, it is a girl cat. Of course, uh, a, girl, a cat may be totally black and totally orange and maybe a girl because the genotype may be homozygous. But here, uh, when there is heterozygous genotype and we see phenotypically cat with patches, we realize that this is girl cat, unless in very rare instances, uh, this is so-called clean filter cat <laughs> that has two X and a Y chromosome, but this is very rare. So each color patch on a cal calico cat has a different X turned on. If the patch is orange, then the cells have orange X turned on. And if the patch is black, the cells have black X turned on. And this is why male calico cat is so rare. Males have just one X, so the um, orange or the black color gene, but they cannot express both. Interestingly, X inactivation is so to say reversed in female germline, so that all oocytes contain an active X chromosome. So now we talk about germline cells, right? And the question is that are, are, are do certain uh, do certain um, oocytes contain active and do the others contain inactive X? No, every oocyte contains active X chromosome. 
Inactivation of X chromosome inter bar body is sometimes referred to a term which is called lionization, according to Mary Lyon. And the Lyon hypothesis became the Lyon law on July 2011 um, at the European Molecular Biology Organization, right? And uh, it was 50 years of X inactivation conference in Oxford. So now let's discuss what's the mechanism of inactivation. X inactivation starts at specific region on the long arm of X chromosome 13.2, and this region is called X inactivation center. And the chromosomes that lack this X inactivation region do not become inactivated. As we said, the X inactivation is necessary for life, and as we said, if the in the embryo uh, X inactivation does not happen, these embryos will not survive. Now, X inactivation center contains several regulatory regions and four genes. One of these genes, which is called X inactivation specific transcript or XIST, this is critical for X inactivation. This is RNA coding gene. XIST is RNA coding gene and produces a huge RNA, which is about 18, 18 kilobase. And this RNA does not have so-called open reading frame. Uh, open reading frame is responsible for translating RNA product into the protein. And the genes that do not have open reading frame, they will not be translated further. But this is functional RNA. Okay, we know that there are protein coding genes and we know that there are RNA coding genes. And one of the very interesting and important RNA coding genes is XIST. So uh, XIST RNA is transcribed, but it is not translated. Later, XIST RNA spreads over and it codes the X chromosome and creates some sort of a cage which inhibits and inactivates X chromosome. So it basically shuts off the chromosome, kind of it puts it in the cage and imprisons it. And then uh, this chromosome will become bar body. So as we said, X inactivation was discovered in 1991. And here again, we have a very nice diagram which shows there is a cell, right? And there are two X chromosomes. And the blue one is the one that will further become inactivated. And what will happen is that from one of the X chromosomes, XIST will start expression. XIC stands for X inactivation center, right? And from, from one of the X chromosomes, XIST starts expression. And it produces RNA and some additional proteins there are. And it codes, it surrounds uh, that X chromosome. And then it, it, it gets shrinked, its chromatin becomes very condensed, it becomes heterochromatic, and then, as we see, further, the cell will further divide by mitosis, and then we realize that all the cells that come from this will be, will have same inactive X. So, Again, XA, right? XA stands for active, XI stands for inactive. And from one X, XIST starts expression, and this will become inactive. And this RNA spreads around, right? And then it is maintained, and it will be like that till the rest of that cell. And then every cell that will be derived from this by mitosis will contain same inactive X. So again, the more simpler uh, representation, right, to X chromosomes, XIST starts expression, this red thing is RNA, and it becomes part of body. Another diagram which uh, depicts uh, active and inactive X chromosomes. So what we need to mention over here is that the initial inactivation, of course, the drive of X inactivation is XIST gene. But further, very complex epigenetic processes start to turn on. And we've talked about what's methylation and acetylation, right? 
And if you look closer on the inactive X, the red dots that we see over here, right? These are methylation. These are methyl groups that add to the DNA. And we understand that methylated DNA is condensed and it's uh, associated with low level of gene expression. Whereas what we see over here on the active X that the gray um, bubbles represent acetylation. And active X is acetylated and acetylation is, uh, um, is connected with open chromatin structure and high level of gene expression. And of course, there are more complex epigenetic changes, right? Histone modifications, the tail modifications, right? Um, and uh, it, it, it's very complex process. The drive is XIST gene, methylation, histone modifications, tail modifications, and so on. Again, act, inactive and active so inactive X, uh, the genes are uh, um, are not uh, escaped, but are, are not transcribed. But of course, we understand here that there are some genes that are still being expressed from the X chromosome, right? And the active X, we see the chromatin is kind of open, right? And it's being transcribed. Transcription of XIST initially occurs at low levels on both X chromosomes, but as the inactivation process begins, transcription of XIST continues and is enhanced only on one X chromosome that will become inactivated. Thus, transcription of XIST is the crucial event in chromosome inactivation. And again, the chromosome, which contains active XIST gene, will become inactive. Now, as we said, X inactivation is totally random process. But of course, every rule has exceptions. And we also realize that sometimes X inactivation may not be random. And we call this non-random or skewed X inactivation. So sometimes, as an exception, X inactivation process may be non-random. And non-random X inactivation means preferential inactivation of mutation containing X chromosome. See how interesting it is that system usually recognizes that if one of the X chromosomes contain mutation, the system will inactivate preferentially mutation containing X chromosome in order to enable the embryo to survive and to express normal phenotype. And such non-random pattern of inactivation has the general effect of minimizing, but not always eliminating the clinical consequences of the particular defect. Thus, Females usually do not demonstrate chromosomal aberrations, microdeletions, duplications, or X-linked conditions because of preferential inactivation of abnormal X. However, if a female exhibits a clear X-linked condition, the pattern of X inactivation should be determined. And for example, 10% of women heterozygous for mutant hemophilia gene developed the disease because of X inactivation. Because in that specific tissue where hemophilia gene is expressed, most probably she has most of active X chromosomes that contain mutation. So some features that distinguish active and inactive X is that inactive X is present as heterochromatic mass, which we'll call bar body, in interface cell. Inactive X replicates late in S phase. Inactive X expresses XIST RNA. Promoter region of inactive X is highly methylated. And inactive X is highly enriched with micro H2A histones specific special types of histones. Thank you. We're done with the topic of sex determination and X inactivation. Have a nice day. Goodbye.